Hi, welcome back. Today we have to make a replacement part for this gear. This is a cast gear. This is the motor adjustment that adjusts the belt tension on a fairly large drill press. Uh, truly not a high precision gear. I could not figure out for the life of me what type of, of gear to shape this is. It, it doesn't match anything regular. So uh, I had to resort to some tricks to, to get to a 3D model to machine it. Normally I would make a form cutter and cut the profile on the milling machine using an indexing head. But in this case, since this is a relatively low precision application and the original gear teeth here look truly like they have been filed to shape, I decided to machine a blank from 42 chromoly, a commercial heat treat, good material which matches the size here, then stand it upright on the CNC router, hold it down and just machine the teeth from above with a small end mill. This is not highly efficient, not highly precise on my machine, but for this purpose, absolutely a-okay. I figured out that I can cut this with a three millimeter end mill and I have two end mills here that I'm going to use. One is a regular three flute with I think there's a 45 degree helix. We need to grind fairly long neck relief onto this end mill. So we can reach down all the way to cut those teeth. I think this is about 20 millimeters, but 20 millimeters depth with a three millimeter end mill is still, still doable. This cutter is made by, or sold by Garant. This is the number 20-22-64-3. Three is the diameter of the tool. And the other one is uh, this is Fraser. Uh, this is a P4535 55 180 diameter, 3 millimeter. And this is a four flute with, a, with an incredible steep helix or shallow helix. Well, it's above 45 degree helix angle. And the, the sales rep from Fraser when he was here told me that these cutters work exceptionally well with a long stick out or a long neck relief because these tend to put a little bit more axial load instead of radial load on the spindle and the machine. Means less deflection on the shank. I use this a lot in aluminium already. This is a very good use tool. <laughs> This has several hundred of meters of cut in aluminum behind it, but today we're gonna cut steel with it. Not a cheap tool by, by far, but also this one does not reach all the way through. We need to grind a little bit more of a neck onto it. Okay, the original wheel here is cast. We will add the two flats later. Here's the blank. I, I didn't follow the shape here in here exactly, just made an undercut for the teeth to, to run out. We're doing here a functional part, not a aesthetic part. But all the dimensions, the functional dimensions will be the same. Here we are in Fusion 360 and you can see the gear as I designed it of the gear supplied by the customer. Very simple part apart from the actual gear teeth. Since they didn't match any module gear profile or diametrical pitch gear profile that I could find, I decided that it would be easiest to put the original gear on a flatbed scanner, an office scanner, and pull the scan into Fusion 360 as a canvas, and then create a sketch of one of the teeth. I could measure the thickness of the tooth with calipers, this is this diameter here, diameter four. That's the gear. That's what I measured off the gear, and I could kind of approximate the the width on the on the foot of the tooth, and I could also measure up here the 1.9 millimeter diameter, also just with calipers. Then I just pulled an arc. Didn't really do a involute construction since it's a fairly coarse application. When I had the sketch, I extruded the profile of the gear with one tooth, added the fillet on, on the foot of the tooth, fillet on the, on the head of the tooth, 
rotary profile or rotary pattern to create 11 teeth. And then just add all the other stuff to make it a full gear. Let's remove the canvas and the sketch. Here we are. This is the final final gear. And also I, I modeled my blank part that I need to prepare on the lathe. Also this serves as a stock in CAM. Then we went into manufacture. Mm, we have one setup, um, X, Y on top, center of the bore. Stock is the model of, of the blank part that I created. And we're ready to go. I did two contour operations. The first one is with a three millimeter end mill, 15,000 RPM, thousand millimeter per ref. And I stepped down 0.15 millimeters per pass. And I did two radial passes with, with a distance of two millimeter. Otherwise there would have been material left. Also, this approach is definitely not the fastest. I could have gone way faster in roughing. And also I could have done the whole profile as an as a ramp movement. So in this case, we do one pass, then it moves down, it does one pass, it moves down, and so on and so on. And with ramping, I could have gone continuously moving the profile and stepping C down continuously. I forgot to do that. But this worked very well. Then I have, as I copied it, uh, again, a three millimeter flat end mill, but this time running it at 15,000 RPM and only 600 millimeters per minute. And I took a, a step down in C of one millimeter for finishing. This is the Fraser 55 degree helix end mill. And this one really worked nicely. Also could have gone ramping on this too, but I forgot to. So only two operations. It says 52 minutes here and that's true. But um, since it's a CNC mill, it runs on its own and I had other work to do in this in the meantime. So not a big deal with, with long cycle time. And running on a one-off, I I prefer to, to do a better be safe than sorry approach and not try to hit crazy high material removal rates. If I had to do 50 of these, I would do it different. I would, I would definitely run this faster. Let's look at our options here. We have devices on the mill. We could machine soft jaws for this part, but I hate cutting soft jaws for one part. Another option would be a three jaw or six jaw chuck that we clamp to the table of the mill. Very good option, but I have to go into the other room to do that, to get the jaw chuck. We could, a very good option would be just to bolt it to the table with one central screw. Again, I would have to go to the other room to get a, a bolt. We could strap clamp it down. Nah, we don't do that. That's too much work. Or I, I, I have the magnet on the mill here. Let's see if, if this... Okay, that's what we're going to do. We're going to mill it on the magnet. But I'm going to put three parallels around it to give it a three-point contact and block it in just in case something happens. This is the super cheap Dragon 150 millimeter magnet chuck from eBay that cost, I think it cost like 70 euros. It's truly stupid cheap. Well, that's the different one here and one here to form a V and one here to block it in. And now we just give it a light tap on here and this fully seats the part into the V we formed with the two parallels here. That's good to go. 
We need to find the center of this part and for this on the CNC router I made this little gadget here. I used to clamp this in, the, in, a, in a collet but that requires you to change out tools and since I'm a little bit lazy I made this aluminium ring boarded eccentrically relief the center here of the bore so we get a two-point contact here and a set screw back here that engages into the slots of the ER collet nut. It also made a marker here so you put it in here you line it up with one of the slots in the of the ER nut slide it over lock it and you're good to go. That's pretty good for centering apart now we set our XY coordinates to zero. We're over at the surface grinder because we need to neck down these end mills so we can reach down 18 millimeters plus a little bit into our work. I put the punch grinder here on the grinder offset with a few parallels from the fence. These punch grinders have a V-block setup standard on them with a screw to hold your work and then you can adjust it for run out. So we can probably just clamp here on the weld on flat, tighten it down with a moderate grunt. We don't want to, to bend the shank like a banana when we do this. Now we can spin it and when we loosen the screw in front here just a little bit then we have a, uh, another hex on the side here and this is a rack and pinion drive and that's used to move it around and adjust it for run out. I like to just visually set the run out first before I get an indicator in. Okay that's pretty good for eyeballing it. I got it within 8 microns here. That's more than adequate for grinding a neck relief on an end mill since the, the neck relief will be smaller than the flute's diameter anyway. So let's put this back in a locked condition. And this even improved it to 6 micron. Nice. I get the indicator out of the way. Now we need to line up the axis of rotation of our spin fixture with the center of the grinding spindle just by eyeballing it. Like this. And set at least one table stop so we can come back to this position if needed. Then we move the second stop in and just use the adjustment screw to lock the table from moving. Now we have a very nice cylindrical grinding setup. Another little project will be to make a small pulley that goes on here so I can drive it with my universal grinding motor drive thing. The hacked apart electric screwdriver that I use to regrind drill press spindles. So let's move this over and get some dust extraction because we're grinding carbide and see where we go. I brought my dust extraction in which is just a nozzle on held with lock line arm on a Mac base. Here's the Mac base with the lock line, a ring with a tapered bore and I just put in a regular nozzle from a shop vac. This one has its opening on the side and I welded the end shut with, with a piece of plastic. Back at the mill with the neck down end mill. Now we need to touch off C height. Now I like to use something round like a, a carbide shank. This is just a six millimeter carbide blank ground into a D bit, but doesn't matter. Any end mill shank will work. And the way I like to do it, I drop the cutter below so I cannot pass through with the carbide pin. Or you can also use a dial pin or a gauge block, but the thing round works better in my experience. And then you set your, your electronic hand wheel, your MPG, to 0.01 millimeter increments and you just slowly move up. That will give you 
a very exact idea when the pin will slip through under the end mill. Here we go. Now we are pretty much perfectly exactly six millimeters away from the top surface of this part. I, I loaded the CNC program and now we're about to start. And what I like to do, I, I pull the feed over right back to zero. I hit start, spindle will spin up and then I will slowly increase the feed and watch where the tool is going. And once I confirm that I'm not plunging through into the, my magnet, I'm good. So, roughing is done, end mill is still in one piece, all looking good apart from this weird line here. And this is where I messed up a little bit. When I necked down the end mill, as you can see, the line is exactly where the necking ends. I didn't grind far enough into the flutes of the end mill and left a little bit of a cylindrical section of the shank behind the flutes left and that rubbed its way down on each pass and left this line here. This will clean up when we do our finishing pass now with the Fraser 55 degree helix finishing end mill. Okay, that 55 degree helix angle end mill worked marvelous, truly marvelous. This looks really, really nice. This is all the milling we're doing on the CNC on this part. Time to get it off the magnet. There we go. There is our final product. Well, apart from the flats and the cross hole, but that's uh, looking pretty good. And comparing it to the original one, 
I have. I I'm. I suspect that mine might be a little bit higher quality, but there's probably also hundred years of technology between this gear and this gear. Uh, they mesh. They they mesh nicely, despite it being not a proper envelope gear shape on on my reconstruction. But since this is rolling on a very coarse, I think it it rolls on a rack. I'm not crazy concerned about it. Nor was the customer. So uh, that's uh, that's looking pretty good to me. Surface finish on on the walls here is really darn good for such a long slender tool. The 55 degree helix angle puts a lot of axial force on the tool and that keeps him from chattering in these internal corners which are 1.5 millimeter. They match the radius of the tool. Normally with a 45 degree or less helix angle tool that leads to fairly catastrophic chatter on such a long necked tool. So I'm, I'm mighty impressed by this tool, <laughs> to say at least. So here we go, part comes off. The nice thing about the magnet is once you pull off everything, it cleans off very nicely. So here we are with the new gear next to the old one. This was quite an interesting project because the gear shape was very puzzling to me. I tried around with a gear profile generator plugin in Fusion 360 and I couldn't match anything. A module 2.75 is very close, but it's also not. I tried around with profile shifting and that didn't do good either. So that's why I resorted to an optical approximation to the gear profile. I don't think that the gear profile for this use case is crazy critical. And also the new material is probably a very good choice and also a little bit of overkill considering the original gear being cast iron, a very coarse grained cast iron I have to say. So there shouldn't be any problem. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you all for watching and I'll be back.